Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Ivory Tower Boiler Room. This is Dr. Andrew Rimby, and I am really excited because usually my guest here is on a lot of gossip or celebrity podcasts, so she already knows that we're going to be diving deep into her education background, and I already have so many questions about all of her entrepreneurial work, um, especially her children's boutique she used to have on the Upper West Side. So... Without further ado, I should introduce Rachel Yucatel to you all. So, Rachel, thank you for joining me here. Of course. Thank you for having me. So, because it is 9-11, I first, you know, wanted to just reflect and everyone out there, you became very infamous or known for two photos. The first, though, was with 9-11. So, if you could, you know, just educate everyone who's listening about how you really became well known for that photo that has been shared around of you after 9-11 with a photo of your uh, late fiance. Yeah, of course. So um, basically, to make the long story short, um, you know, my fiance, Andrew O'Grady, um, his name was James Andrew O'Grady, we called him Andy. Um, he had gone to work that morning and I was at Bloomberg working that morning. I had gone into work at 5 a.m. And obviously we all know how that day panned out and what happened. Um, but where that photo that you're asking me about took place was because a couple of days later, um, I believe it was only a, maybe a day or two later, I was, uh, I think it was the Wednesday. I, so I was looking for, um, I was doing what everyone else was doing, which was they were going to Kinko's, they were making up sheets that said the last time, you know, they saw their loved one that was missing, the stats about him, had a picture. And I was going from hospital to hospital, standing in the lines with everybody else, trying to find out if his name was on the list. So where that photo was taken, it was at Bellevue Hospital. Um, I had been, I had just come from being in the line and they had told me that um, he was not on the list. And, uh, you know, basically a, a crowd of, you know, journalists, paparazzi, whatever they were at the time, were asking questions to a lot of different people. And I was just trying to bring awareness to who he was. But that photo was actually taken after the cameras um, stopped rolling. And um, I just remember, you know, listen, I was 26 years old. I just remember saying to them, like, you know, please help me. He's my whole life. Like, I don't know what to do without him. And so while I had been talking to the cameras, I was, you know, I, I was speaking really well. I was very clear. I was not crying. But after that, you know, I gave that segment kind of um, right after I, I kind of broke down as I was saying that. So that's where you get that shot of me like crying um, because I, I was like, please, please help me do what you can to help me. Well, and you've talked a lot about how after, you know, first, I'm so sad about the loss of your late fiance and that day and the aftermath. But, you know, 22 years later now, I can't even believe I mean, I was in third grade when 9-11 happened and now I'm 30. Um, mm -hmm. So time is just flying by. But I remember you talking so openly and poignantly about how many people reached out to you. It was this huge support group of messages you received. Like, you know, what were they saying when they reached out to you? Who was reaching out to you? Well, so that picture ran in every paper in the world. It was on the cover of most papers. So I was legitimately getting letters from everywhere as far as uh, New Zealand, Australia, Germany, um, you know, I was the face of tragedy. You know, I was the face uh, that they could put a story to to connect if they were not part of 9-11. So they were really following my story. I mean, I even remember a guy who was based here in America. I think he was from Michigan. He wrote a song for Andy, like a full on ballad and uh, about this girl he had seen looking for her fiance, which was me and um, sent it to me. And it was you know, it was incredible, um, you know, how many people were looking for Andy, wanted to know what happened, were following that story. And, 
you know, they, they just were, their hearts were breaking for the situation at hand, but I think it, it became something that they could invest in when they saw this like fresh faced 26 year old girl who had, you know, uh, a very handsome, gregarious, you know, um, person that they had lost. And so they could identify with that, you know? Well, and when you were on celebrity rehab with Dr. Drew, there's this very just, I mean, it resonated with me, Rachel. There is this moment in celebrity rehab where Dr. Drew says something like, Rachel, can you share with the group what you told me yesterday? And then you open up about two major losses when you were 15 at the Millbrook school and correct me if I'm wrong, but at the boarding school, you learned that your father from the headmaster had passed away from a cocaine overdose. And then you're, you know, Andy passing away from 9-11 and you share this all with the group. And it just really, you say that it's not that you are sad now when you reflect on it, when it happened after a year with Andy, but you say that actually there was feelings of anger, yeah. anger because these two major men in your life left. You know, how do you reflect on that now? You know, your father and Andy and how you phrased that then when you were on celebrity rehab. Yeah. So like just hearing you say it kind of makes me tear up. Um, <clears throat> so I, th I think the way I dealt with it back then was I just, for both losses, they were in such tragic ways. Um, and to correct you, it wasn't at Millbrook. It was, I went to Millbrook after I went to CEDU. I, I found out about it when I went to CEDU, which was a therapeutic boarding school that I was sent to from when I was just, I had just turned 13 to basically till I was almost 16. And that was, you know, we can get into that separately, but that was a whole very like abusive um, therapeutic boarding schools, in my opinion, are very abusive. Uh, it was shut down for abuse. And um, so it was a horrible place to find out that my father had died because I was still hoping I would get out of it or my mother had sent me there. Um, and he, my father was very upset that I was there. Um, so anyway, um, I, of course I was sad, but for me, my feelings didn't really kick in because so many people are around you at the onset of a tragedy, right? There's people in your house, there's people calling, there's a lot going on. So you can kind of get through it because you're, there's so many people around, but after a year, you know, you're the only one that's still stuck with those feelings and everyone else has gone on with their lives. So I just remember, you know, later on feeling like how, why would you do this to me? You know, to regarding my father, like, why would you choose drugs over your kid? Why would you choose to do something that would affect your life like that? And then with Andy, you know, I was angry at the world, not at him, you know, but like, in what world does like, do I get engaged two weeks before I finally find the love of my life, like the guy I want to spend the rest of my life with. And, you know, it was an honor for me to have been loved by someone like Annie, Andy, like he was the best guy ever. So, um, and then he's killed by terrorists. Like how, how, how does that even happen? You can't even make that up. It would sound too ludicrous. So um, I was just angry. I was angry at everybody for, um, for feeling like these, you know, this situation happened, but you know, I, it was almost easier to, to sort of blame them and say they'd chosen to leave me. Of course they didn't choose it, but you know, at the time, that's the feeling that was resonating with me. Yeah. Do you still keep in touch with Andy's family or, you know, is there correspondence that's happened over the years? No. So immediately they blamed me. I was on the phone with Andy when, um, when he, when the plane hit, um, I was covering the story for news. I worked for Bloomberg news, as I said, and, um, you know, we were on the trading room floor, we were covering it and he was telling me what he was seeing out the window. And because the first tower had already been hit and he was on the 104th floor. And so he was looking, he could look right across and he was telling me, you know, Rachel, you don't understand what I'm looking at. I'm looking at papers flying through the air. I'm looking at people, you know, hanging out of the windows, like waving, um, you know, trying to get people's attention. And then he was watching people jump and he said, God, um, you know, what must be going on in that room for them to choose to jump out of the window? So um, I, he had said right before uh, the phone went dead, okay, you know, I think I'm going to try and make it down. 
Um, he had been in the first bombing in 1993 and they were told to just stay put and they went to the roof and they played poker um, until they were told to evacuate. Um, I think it was like something like eight hours later. So, um, you know, uh, as he told me that, and I was on a trading room floor, you know, there's televisions everywhere. We have three televisions on our, each person's desk. Uh, and then the whole trading room has TVs up on the or surrounding the ceiling. And I saw the second plane hit. I think, you know, I don't know if you remember, but we all thought it was fuselage from the first plane um, exploding. So no one really knew that it was a second plane until it got replayed. Um, and then people started to figure out, figure it out within a few minutes, but um, his phone went dead. So I, you know, I, I didn't think he was hurt. I wasn't scared per se, but I just, cause of course I couldn't even come up with the idea that the building would fall. I mean, the, the, like, how could you have like the creative vision of like, okay, these buildings were hit, but like, they're going to fall. Like, no, that was not even in my mind. So I really wasn't worried at that time, which is odd to say now, but I thought he would make it out. Has it been tough for you, Rachel, like over these years, have you gone through your own process of, I mean, you're so powerfully open about this narrative now, but I'm assuming that it's taken time for you to cohesively reflect. Like it's not right away that you were opening up about your story or maybe you were. Well, I mean, I'll be honest with you. I think that parts of me are still stuck as a 26 year old girl who, you know, has a huge sense of grief and loss that probably stifles me from being in real relationships or something. I mean, I'm not married. Um, I have never really found, you know, someone who I consider the love of my life since then, you know, to be, you know, just to be frank. I mean, maybe people that I've been with have probably assumed they were, but in reality, that's not the case. And um, yeah, I can talk about it. I don't really talk about it during the year, you know, but when the anniversary comes around, I do share it because I think it's important to remind people of Andy. You know, that's the reason why I think it's important. And also, you know, listen, in human nature, you want to connect with people, right? So everyone has a connection on that day of what they went through. Me being able to share mine helps people kind of remember where they were, or they get interested in hearing somebody who really was touched by it, but it still brings up major emotions for me. It still is something that's very hard for me to, to deal with almost like it was last week. You know, um, it affected me to my core. I feel that in my bones all the time, you know, Andy, somebody in the background of my life, that's always there. Even my 11 year old daughter, who of course wasn't born during this, um, you know, knows him as someone who is a part of my life, almost a part of her life. And it's odd in schools, they don't teach about September 11th in history class, at least not yet for her age. And, um, you know, I, I think that's odd because I would feel like that's a day that she could share, you know, she could share the loss that I've gone through and how she's grown up knowing about this person. So I wish they would teach that in lower school. Now she's moved to middle school. So we'll see this year um, how they how they cover it. Yeah, it's I mean, so many of my close friends or even growing up in New Jersey, but by Philly, um, so many talk to me about the 9-11 Museum. Is that a place that you visited, Rachel, or is it too jarring? Like, would it be too um, emotional to enter into it? So I've only been once. I went on the 10-year anniversary. Um, oh, no, not the 10-year anniversary. I'm sorry. I went like five years ago. So um, um, I, it was very difficult for me to, to be in that room, but also it was very, I felt like I had a closeness with all the stuff that I was seeing. So it was really important for me to go. I would go back with my daughter to show her so that she sees what it's like. I mean, my photo is in there, you know? Um, so, and Andy's photo is in there also, you know? So I, I um, you know, I would go back, but yeah, it was really hard to go there for me, for me. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing this, Rachel. I just appreciate it. I, you know, even when I was rewatching you on Celebrity Rehab, it's a reality show, but you were so dedicated to journeying through your 
mission of being open and trying to, I mean, recover from love, love addiction, which I know you had mixed feelings about whether that was an addiction or not, yeah. even telling Dr. Drew, like, I think this is crap. Um, but let's see what happens. But it seems that you really did gain a lot from that experience. I mean, how did celebrity rehab help you? Well, you know, a lot of people are talking right now about what it's like to be on a reality show. And I can tell you from my experience that there was nothing about it that was edited to make someone look the way that they didn't portray themselves while we were in it. And it was not a show. We were all in rehab. Um, you know, Lace Garrett was withdrawing from heroin. Uh, other people were coming off of whatever it was that they were coming off. And I had eight people total on my show, including me. Two of them are, are now dead for, um, you know, drug related things. So it really is something that can kill you, right? It was very serious. My group took it very seriously. And in all the, the groups before and after, I know people have taken it seriously. And I've become friends with a lot of them, like Dwight Gooden was on the season after me. Um, He's such a spectacular guy, but addiction has something been something that has affected his life. And um, we're all kind of in it together. I'm really good friends with Michael Lohan, who was in the season after me as well with Dwight, Jeremy Jackson. I just had on my show. He was on it. Uh, and, and his mission and his life has been about recovery and teaching people how to um, come up from their rock bottom and really be who they're supposed to be. So um, I loved being on the show. I mean, I, obviously it was really hard. Um, there's a point where I leave because I get into a huge argument um, with Janice Dickinson and uh, I think she's there for the wrong reasons and I just get kind of fed up by the whole thing. And I start to realize what reality TV is. Like people are there because they get a paycheck and they want airtime and they want to make a scene in front of the cameras. And I was like, I'm not a reality star. I mean, I am now because I'm in it, but like, you're not going to do this around me. I'm here to get help. And so we have a whole um, knockdown drag out fight about it. And um, I leave and ultimately I come back and um, it, it was a, that was a great, ep it covers two episodes, but it was, um, it was nothing was edited uh, differently than how we were at the house. I will say that. Was it really difficult because of your father's addictions when you were in celebrity rehab? Like you kind of being, I mean, I know they say you had a pill addiction, but I mean, you could clear that record. Like it seems like Leif Garrett, he is going through severe withdrawal at the beginning. And I remember there's a moment where you say, Rachel, please leave, don't leave. Like you're my support system. Yeah. So yeah, I, was loved, it I loved Leif. He was great. And I really connected with him. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, because, you know, I am somebody who's dealt with someone with addiction. Um, I feel an affinity for people like that. I feel like I can help them. I have this like savior mentality that I feel like I, I, I want to try and help them and save them. So I really connected with all the people on that show um, for the most part, but especially Leif, because he was so deep in it, you know? Um, but uh, and he was just so even keel and cool. I mean, he was just the coolest dude and really got me. A lot of other people were like goofy and, you know, Jason Davis was um, constantly goofing around and, you know, just in his own shit. But Leif and I were were really good buddies. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, yeah. Well, and wait, who is Ke uh, Ke is it Keisha Cole? This oh, so Frankie Lons was... Um, Keisha Cole's mom. Yes. She also is unfortunately one of the ones who has passed away. No, that's sad. Yeah, that's very sad. I mean, because yeah. there's a moment where she even talks about the cameras are watching her naked or. Um, yeah, she was, that was about that. She yes, was, but I loved her so much, but she's one of the ones who, you know, when I left for that night, she's like, the house is different without Rachel. Rachel was my support. I, you know, I need Rachel back. And like all that stuff really meant a lot to me. I really connected with those people. Oh, and so what you asked before, um, it wasn't hard for me to be around people with addictions because I, I, you know, I've dated people with addictions. It's probably my pattern to try and, you know, give chances to people that I shouldn't and you should have real boundaries. But um, no, I, I really, I enjoyed being with those people. Yeah, and I'm so glad you opened up about that reality show aspect or putting it on for the cameras because even when you're opening up about your journey, I mean, you can tell 
I don't know Janice Dickinson, but I can tell in her mind, she's just really interested in this drama about someone talking against her with plastic surgery or he, I forget his name, but he was like making comments about her. And then you're in the pool with Janice and she like, it just is this igniting this firestorm for TV. Yeah. And you're there just <laughs> trying to have a clear conversation and it's the paths are not crossing. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, the person that was making fun of her was Jason Davis, who unfortunately is no longer with us as well. Um, but he was such a great guy. Yeah. But he made fun of her a lot, unfortunately. Yeah. So everyone could rewatch that on VH1. But, you know, I have to bring up, I put out this call for questions for Rachel. And like I thought, the questions all revolved around a scandal that you had Rachel in 2009, but everyone can read about that. You've talked about the aftermath of, you know, Tiger Woods and that scandal. But what I'm really here and I'm so just happy to have this moment and conversation with you is the heart and the intelligence of everything you bring to your work, Rachel, and your passion. It really comes through. And I'm sure you know, but your last name, Yukatel, actually means teacher in Russian. I do know. And, and I find that such a beautiful metaphor because you really are now a teacher with your Misunderstood podcast or just how you're helping others from you being in the limelight overnight, how then when news spreads about the scandal, it's so different than what happens in 2001 with 9-11. So how does it feel when people hear your name and they automatically go to what happens happened to you in 2009? Is it tough to know what's going through their mind? Yeah, well, it's not tough to know what's going through their mind. I know what's going through their mind. Um, no, I just, for me, obviously, at this point, um, it's been... 14 years since that. And, you know, I just remind people, imagine if your biggest mistake was not only front page news, but the biggest, one of the biggest scandals in the world and will always remain. Um, so of course it was a mistake, um, but the way that the, the media and the public treated me after has been horrific. And um, at some point, you know, it gets to the point where you're no longer apologizing for your behavior because really that apology is just between a few people. Um, and uh, it's more like, listen, I was reduced to a headline and I've been on a mission to change my narrative for for a de over a decade now. And um, I know that that's a universal feeling that a lot of people, they don't have to go through a major scandal, but that um, they feel like when their name is out there, that they, you know, that's all people know of them. And it's been very difficult to to have people think they know me for something that isn't, you know, what I should be reduced to. Well, and learning more about your childhood has been fascinating for me, Rachel. Like, again, so many when you hear, when people hear your name, they think of that scandal and headline. But then when you look at the depths of your work, or you've even mentioned working for Bloomberg News, but I know even before that, your family, your grandfather owns the Morocco Club in Manhattan, right? And yeah, El Morocco, yeah. El Morocco, thank you. And I know that you also were born in Anchorage, Alaska, which is interesting to me because it seems like your whole family was in Manhattan. So how did that even happen? How did you, why were you born in Anchorage? So I was born in Anchorage because my parents went to Anchorage on a date, if you could believe it, from Manhattan. And um, they ended up staying there. And my parents um, started cable television there. Um, they built the biggest, first they built the biggest um, construction company. It was called Yucatel. Uh, my father um, was trying to make money just to support a new bride. They decided to get married there. Um, and he was plowing people's driveways um, well, he was shoveling them actually, and he made enough money to buy a caterpillar, which is the you know the big plow, and um, was then plowing people's um, driveways, and was able to buy three or four, and then developed a construction company with that money. He was able to buy a satellite dish, which brought cable television to Anchorage, Alaska. And my mother had been a 
um, an actress in Manhattan before she moved there. So she did all the on-air stuff. She did all the intros to the movies. She did the news. She did the weather. She did all sorts of stuff because they didn't have that back then. And she was the programming director. So they did all this, you know, interesting stuff in the 70s that now, obviously, it's very professional. Back then in Alaska, it it was kind of thrown together. So um, that's why I was in in Anchorage when I was born. Um, My parents got divorced when I was five. So I went with my mother back to New York City. And that is where I, I grew up. Do you think your parents, like, look at you now with Misunderstood, all of this TV exposure, you were on Extra, I think, reporting about nightclubs Mm. and like all of this TV production experience you have. Do you feel that it's just in your blood, like you and the camera? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's something to that. You know, my grandparents, as we were talking about, own El Morocco, which was the biggest nightclub um, in the country, um, where all the celebrities would go there, you know, um, John Kennedy, uh, would come in from Washington DC when he was president and borrow my grandfather's car and his driver to take him through Manhattan. And, uh, you know, even Nixon was coming to his nightclub, like literally everyone, Marilyn Monroe. Um, so it was the place to be. So, uh, that was very much like a production as well. So, you know, it's, um, you know, and then even when I moved on to um, doing um, nightclubs myself, when I opened up uh, Tau in Las Vegas, it was like being in production because it's it's like hosting a show because everything is so regimented and you have to make sure things are to a schedule. So when the doors opened, it was like running a TV show. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I definitely have had the background for sure and the experience for my whole life. Yeah. Well, and recently, Teddy Mellencamp on Two T's in a Pod name dropped you and said, oh, yeah, Rachel got me in when I was 19 uh, into clubs. So it seems like you were kind of that gateway to going behind the rope. Is that true? Like, or is there more? I'm sure there's more to what you were doing. Well, yeah. I mean, I was the director of VIP operations. I'm the one that had to take care of the celebrities. I'm the one that decided where everyone was sitting. I'm the one that decided where everyone, what everyone was paying. Um, And then I had a a host team of like 15 people under me. And then I managed the security guards and managed the waitresses. So, you know, it was a show that was mine, right? So I wasn't just letting people in at the front. Um, A lot of people miss represent my job back then, but you know, there are the four owners and then there was me. So, and I was the face of their club. So um, it, it was a pretty big deal what I did. And yes, I knew Teddy. She was one of my clients. She would come into Vegas. I would get her a table. I would make sure she wasn't paying because her, she came from a famous family. We had a, uh, you know, now I think it's different. I think everyone has to pay, but back then we took care of her. Like she was a, um, you know, a VIP, which she always has been. She's a great girl. And so all of this with Vegas is after, um, so after Bloomberg News, you go to Extra and then you go to Vegas. Is that the timeline? No, ex- Extra was just a, a, a brief stint. I was friends with Mario Lopez. He asked me to co-host with him for a week. Um, and I went to LA to co-host with him, which was super fun. Um, but that wasn't supposed to be a long thing. And uh, I went to... Um, you know, I did, you know, my life was all in sections, which is really odd, right? So I did, uh, I did the Vegas thing. Um, Let's see, I got married again after, um, after September 11, uh, to an older friend who I just wanted it to stick, I was like, ready to be married, you know what I mean? And that was not for love, it was for friendship. And that didn't work out. I really wanted a love story. So we got, um, separated. And I basically went to the Mercedes dealership, picked out a car, said I'd like it to be ready. At, you know, on Thursday, I enlisted a girlfriend of mine, Hillary, to drive across country with me until I figured out where I wanted to go. And she was in a sort of a pickle with her boyfriend at the time. Um, she found out he was cheating on her. And so she, I told her she could bring one bag. I had one bag <clears throat> and I had my two dogs. Uh, Rudy Giuliani and Ozzy Osbourne. And we just started driving and we didn't really know where we were going. And the first night we were driving, Jason Strauss, who owned Tao, who was my boyfriend from when I was 12, called and said, what are you doing? And I um, 
I said, I'm just, I left Stephen and I'm driving to figure out where I want to be. And he said, well, come to Vegas and I will give you a job. So I, it created a sense of purpose for me. And that's why I went out to Vegas. After Vegas, I came back to New York and ran their companies, Jason's companies, clubs in um, New York City. I've done clubs in St. Bart's. I went out and worked for myself. I've gone back to Vegas to, to run clubs for a different um partnership, uh, the light group. So I've kind of done it all. Well, and now you're in Palm Beach. Now so Beach. yeah. How did that happen? How did you eventually move to Florida? Well, I have been coming to Palm Beach my entire life. My grandparents live here. My mother has a house here. Um, and during COVID, you know, living in New York was really hard with a dog and my daughter who must've been nine, eight, nine, seven, eight, nine, something like that at the time. And so I literally just got in a, uh, got on a plane as soon as you were allowed to. And I came to Palm Beach. I rented a townhouse um, here and it was like the best experience because Florida was more open. But even though we were really being careful, it just, it was so much nicer of a place where I could, um, you know, be out, be, you know, available, be doing things. So it wasn't, um, you know, we weren't stuck in our homes. It was really tough, you know, being stuck in our home. Well, your Palm Beach lifestyle looks beautiful. And just, I try to imagine myself. I've never been to Palm Beach. I've only been on the West in Sarasota. My grandparents had a place, um, yeah. but I'm like, okay, South Florida is calling me one of these days. Uh, but you know, so Manhattan, Palm Beach, Vegas, is there a certain place that really keeps Rachel Yucatel's mind going? Is there a place that just feels, do you need all of that scenery or do you feel really settled now in Florida? Um, I feel really settled. I love Florida. It's like where I want to be. I've been wanting to move here forever. It took me a whole lawsuit with my ex-husband to get uh, the ability to bring my daughter down here. Uh, it's just a safer environment, I think, for everyone. Living in New York had gotten really tough. And, uh, you know, now I have two dogs and I have my daughter. She started school here. It's just a much better environment, I think, to live in than Manhattan at the moment. Yeah. So, you know, opening up about your misunderstood podcast, what has where did that idea even begin? How did you know, OK, a podcast, this is what Rachel needs to do? Well, I have been on a lot of people's podcasts for quite a while, giving away, you know, people interviewing me about my story. And what I realized is that I have, you know, I wanted to have the ability to talk about people who had been through what I had been through. And, you know, a lot of these people with big podcasts have been saying, you're great, you, sh you should have this. But that wasn't really the, you know, the driving factor for me. My show, um, Misunderstood, is really what I've gone through in my life. And I want to give a platform to others. So the show is about people who, who have been reduced to a single headline and are on a mission to change their narrative. And that's exactly what I went through. The people I'm interviewing um, have definitely felt like that. I think being misunderstood is a universal feeling that most people understand they've gone through um, or they've witnessed it, right? So it's great to hear from the people that we maybe haven't heard from before to talk about that scenario. It doesn't have to be a scandal. It could be something um, that, you know, they just personally have gone through. And then if I'm not interviewing a guest about themselves, I'm definitely interviewing a guest about a topic that I think should be reconsidered that I find super interesting that people might not know a lot about. You know, I talked about um, one of our best episodes actually was about ketamine infused therapy for um, for depression and PTSD that did so well. And it was so interesting because I think a lot of people think of ketamine as a drug that people abuse. Um, and I think in the future, that will be something that is more prescribed than medicine um, than over the counter medicine or, you know, uh, prescription medicine like antidepressants. And then just recently, I interviewed someone about, um, you know, suicide assisted deaths, um, which is becoming, you know, I think it's uh, legal in 10 states now. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding it, almost like abortion. It's about people, you know, thinking that it's wrong. And it was very interesting to hear um, Judith Bishop's uh, perspective on it. She is someone you can actually hire to sit by your bed and, um, you know, facilitate that death. So, and she um, used to be um, the head of obstetrics at UCLA, um, excuse me, at UCSF. 
and deliver babies. So from going to, from delivering babies to bringing someone out of this world, it's very, her perspective was super interesting. So um, I love having the podcast because we drop twice a week. I'm, you know, at first it was supposed to be once a week, but I, I have so many guests that I just have to keep pumping them out, right? Because so many people want to do the show. And now I'm in an incoming phone call business where people are asking me to do the show, which feels so great. And we're number three in the country, as you know. So obviously it's resonating with enough people. Well, and what I love is when people in my orbit, I'll tell them about your podcast and they say, oh, that makes sense. Like there's so many things that are misunderstood. Like you said, even topics. One of my favorite episodes is with Courtney Tillia about OnlyFans. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know she was about to get her PhD. That resonates since I have my PhD. Yeah. But even me sitting with you right now, Rachel, wouldn't have happened if I didn't go into this other media academic venture, which is yeah. outside the university. And, you know, I think that so many of us right now are taking chances of just doing things against the grain. Do you feel that way that you yourself are also entering into a new pathway? Yeah, well, I think it's important to always be challenging yourself and always be, um, you know, finding something that's uncomfortable because that makes you, you know, more well-rounded. And if you stay in the comfort zone, um, you know, you're you're just only going to go in one lane. You got to get a little uncomfortable to see change, right? And to, to grow. So for me, um, yes, it's been uncomfortable. Every time I go to interview someone, I'm always a little nervous right before I do it because I want it to be a good interview. I want it to get new things out of them that we haven't heard. And obviously I, I, you know, I'm creating a platform for these people. So I want them to trust me. So, um, so that is always uncomfortable, but um, I know that we have a common bond in the topic. So I, I ultimately know that it will work out well. Well, and maybe getting your education in there, your bachelor's in psychology might be uh it might uh, come to bear on a lot of just yeah. how you're able to read people. Yeah. So I do have my um, my degree in psychology. I find people and human nature interesting, which is another thing that I talk about in sort of the intro of my podcast that we get to understand um, human nature, why people do things the way they do them and the power of second chances. And I also have my master's. I got my master's in um, forensic investigation, which I just happened to find true crime super interesting and wanted to be educated in it and see what that was like. I mean, listen, when you're taking classes and you're interested in the topic, you are going to do really well. If I, you know, when I took classes on business, God, it just went over my head. I just was not interested. That's just not my thing. But psychology, I did really well. Um, you know, forensic investigation, I did really well because I was super interested. So my my suggestion to people always is study the things that you're really interested in. Don't go against the grain on something like that because you just will you will be struggling the whole time to pay attention, to want to be there, to be present in the moment. So you know, I I I've chosen a path that I was personally interested in. Well, and after Courtney's episode, I have to ask, Rachel, are you going to be announcing some big news about your OnlyFans? Well, it's something that I've always wanted to do. Who wouldn't want this extra side job um, so you make a little a little income? But after that that episode, you know, she broke it down in such a way that she was so great. And I was like, oh, I could do this. You don't have to like, you know, do things that are dirty and naked, you know, in OnlyFans, you could... Um, you know, be doing the dishes that you know, there, everybody has an opportunity to showcase themselves however they want to. So it is not a closed door for me. Let's just say that. Yeah. Even with Shanna Mokler, you said, um, or Shanna Mokler, you said that the public's perception, I think you're quoted as saying that someone would be sucking dick. <laughs> I, I think is what you say, but you're like, uh, Shana, you've uh, pulled back the curtain on that and showed us there's so much more to this OnlyFans venture. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I love, though, how you go there always. You have no qualms about being blunt and frank. And I attribute that to your Manhattan personality. Probably. Uh, yeah, probably. I'm not well, very <laughs> Well, I think you're a very full of social etiquette. Mm -hmm. uh, and decorum. 
But, you know, it's just been so wonderful, Rachel, having this discussion with you. You also can release, too, that you have a Patreon, especially because we briefly touched upon your journey into Vegas. But I know eventually you're going to do more of your life journey that yeah. hasn't been talked about that right. you haven't and, revealed on podcasts. Yeah, I'm going to start, you know, at least once a week putting out just content of my own where I just sort of turn on the mic at any given point in the week. And I'm sure it'll be more than once a week, right? Where I just want to talk and have someone listen. So I think it'll be really cool to, um, you know, to see how Patreon does. I hope that um, your listeners will sign up and and uh, give it a chance at least for a month to, to see what it's like to get to know someone, you know, kind of while they're just sitting alone, having their thoughts and uh, want to share. Like, you know, for example, my daughter, um, just was in the hospital two nights ago. Uh, she slipped and fell and how life can change on a dime. She had to get six staples in her head and um, her foot broke in three places. And that was really traumatic for me. So, you know, I, that's something like I would turn the mic on two days later now and kind of go through what I, what I felt, what I went through um, and how people have received that news uh, has been very interesting to me because I'm here in a new town and um, so, you know, that will be one of the things that I talk about on my Patreon, because I think a lot of people can identify what that's like when you all of a sudden you're fine. But then next thing you know, you're in a state of fear and panic and don't know what's going to happen. Um, and so whatever, we'll talk about that on the Patreon um, as as well as all the different stories of who I am and how I got here that uh, a lot of them are saved for my book um, that I'm working on. But I will be telling them in a, in a little bit of a different way from from a mic, you know? Yeah. So patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel, you could tell I have it in this podcast show notes. I have links to Rachel's website that has her podcast, how to contact her. If you think you're misunderstood, reach out to Rachel. Um, I've had people say I should create an OnlyFans. So maybe Rachel, you and I will have to, we'll see. Um, yeah. I know that my parents are freaking out if I ever created one. Uh, oh, so That's I'm an only child. I don't want to, you know, I already talk a lot about sexual topics and being unapologetically gay. There's only so far I want to push the envelope here. Right. Uh, right. So right, well, We'll talk about it. We'll figure it out. We'll talk about it. Okay. And if it happens, I'll blame you, Rachel. Uh, <laughs> so thank your you parents, so much. Your parents yeah. can call me. They'll call you. Oh, yeah. I'm, if you give them your number, don't worry. You'll be getting calls. Uh, so how can everyone follow you, uh, Rachel, on uh, your social media accounts? Uh, I'm on Instagram at Rachel Yucatel NYC. And I do read my DMs. So you can feel free to DM me. I would love if you guys went on um, to Apple or Spotify and listen to an episode. And then, um, you know, if you could take the time to write a review, that's always really helpful. It helps us get to up on the Apple um, charts on Spotify charts, you know, so if people are are um, leaving reviews and five stars and um, yeah, if you have any suggestions for, for guests, definitely DM me um, or DM Andrew. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Rachel. This has been wonderful. And I feel we pulled back a lot of layers and there's still more, there's always yeah. more to a person's psyche. Yes. Well, I'm happy to come on again at some point we can, um, have more conversations about different topics. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Rachel. Have a good day. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, bye.